Hi, my name is Anna Grace Moore, and I am a student in TJ Zito's Journalism and Mass Communications Broadcasting class at Sanford University. And today's video will kind of cover some of the lectures that we talked about in class, the first being the history of video editing lecture. So there were a couple of cool things that I wanted to touch on in that video that I really, really liked. One of them was how I learned about cutting and splicing videos. So this kind of term refers to how videos were first made back in the day when videos were made on tape. In order to edit videos after uh, filming, what you would have to do is take little razors and individually cut spaces where you wanted to edit or kind of delete some footage. Then you would have to splice them or paste them back together in order to make like a smooth full run of a tape. So that was kind of cool, I didn't know that actually. We also talked about framing shots, about where you want to kind of shoot and what type of location you're looking for and how that kind of brings it all together. But a cool thing is up on the big screen, you know, you see videos and pictures moving so quickly, but what you don't even realize that like one of those little flicker seconds is actually 24 frames. So when you're a kid and you see like a little post-it note kind of thing and they have a bunch of drawings on it and you like pull your thumb back and it flips through and it makes like uh, the little mouse dance or whatever picture is moving on that, that's kind of what it is like on the big screen. So that just is in more definition. So realizing those two things, I started thinking to myself, how would this kind of help me understand the digital landscape that we're working with nowadays? So now that I understand a lot about video editing and how it works, I have a greater appreciation for just being able to go on like Avid or Adobe and doing everything digitally. I don't actually have to take the time to cut and splice and then worry about if I ruin some tape later on. Which organizing tape and different shots kind of brings me to my next point about our organization lecture in class. This one was really cool because it talked about saving time and saving money. Two things that I really, really enjoy because I don't like wasting either. So filmmaking is quite expensive, which is why it's so important to have a plan going in. So we talked about creating a chart in which you can have your date on one side, where you want the shot being taken, what type of shot you're going to take in like a wide angle, for example, the description of the shot, which could be like, Anna Grace walking to class on a rainy day, and then you could have what people are involved in the shot and then what type of equipment that you're using for the shot. Having a chart like that for every single take that you're gonna have in a film is quite important because you know exactly where it's gonna be and what it's gonna take to get it done and who's gonna be involved in it. This way you don't waste so much time and money later. This uh, also kind of refers to B-roll. I had no idea what that was coming into this class. So B-roll is basically any extra footage that you take in order to create a film. So let's say like if I'm in an interview, for example, and I'm talking to Dr. Westmoreland about the new improvements to the food court, I might go to the food court, you know, take a couple of shots of people like in the new Chick-fil-A or getting coffee at O'Henry's and have that playing in the background while I have Dr. Westmoreland speaking. So what you see is the food court <coughs> that he's talking about, but what you hear is his voice, which is also kind of cool. And all of this refers to me because as a young filmmaker and as someone who would love to be a YouTuber one day, I'm gonna have to know how to do all of these things to save my time so I don't waste time taking extra shots that I don't need and to save my money because if I hire like you know, a mic guy or a sound guy to like help me out, I would have to pay them extra for any extra hour of work that I have to take on, you know, on a Sunday afternoon filming if I didn't allot that time in first in my schedule. So knowing all of these organization techniques are quite uh, handy when it comes in, but when you're talking about techniques, <coughs> it's also important to notice like what type of equipment you're using. For example, we talked about in class with our camera and lighting lecture, we talked about like movies and widescreen. <coughs> <Woo. laughs> so cameras in widescreen, um, when you see like movies pulled up on Netflix or Hulu, one kind of cool thing that we had looked at was um, 
all of those movies are shot in like a four by three, meaning that when a movie comes on, it says, this movie was edited to fit this screen. That's what it kind of means. It was shot in a certain way. So it basically means that you turn your phone or your camera sideways, and that's what it means by widescreen. I did not know that. Why that's cool um, is because I learned that when filming, I should turn my phone sideways to have more of a widescreen definition. Not only that, but definition in high definition is what we want to shoot in, and that refers actually to how many pixels are on the screen. These are all new things that I'm learning about that I didn't know before in class, and I'm also really excited to share. So the cool thing about that is you really need to know the difference between like good lighting and bad lighting. I love the Kardashians because they're hilarious, but they're also a really great example of that. I have seen episodes of their shows like way back in the day before they were really ever that famous, and you can see their foundation like extremely orange on the show and like everything's like kind of like a pink or a rosy kind of color and it's to kind of like cover up that their face doesn't look like a natural color. Yes, they're probably wearing a lot of makeup, but with the lighting that they have, it didn't look good. It didn't make them appear right on screen. So taking a selfie and looking at yourself in one light is a whole lot different than filming without the correct lighting and then having it show up on the big screen. So that was one of the things we touched about in class, especially in our guest lectures, uh, our guest lecture. Mrs. Wendy Zito, uh, my teacher's wife, actually came in and spoke to us, and you know, she had a lot of good tips to share, especially about foundation, which as a girl, I was like jumping at that real quick. She actually talked about a couple of different ones, such as land gum. Now, as a girl who has more fair skin, this was cool to me because usually you want to find a foundation that fits your color. She actually said that Lancome makes your skin appear a lot whiter or a lot more light on camera. So that was something that really spoke to me because I realized I need to look nice and presentable, but not like a ghost on the big screen. She also said a couple of cool things that you want to look out for is when you're taking a shot um, or when you are making your sound, you want to have like a mic kind of overhead and a way to do that without kind of having like, you know, your hand flipping back and forth or if you're like trying to stand there and your hand is shaking. One cool thing to avoid that is actually to attach the camera or the microphone to a longer pole. That way the actual microphone or camera does not shift as much, but the pole does that you're holding on to. And that can be made out of something really light and really hollow and really cheap, such as PVC pipe. That of which you can get for literally dollars, and I mean dollars, at places like Home Depot or Lowe's or anything like that. And so that's something that a college kid can afford. So learning all of these different things will definitely help me in the filmmaking world, and I'm just extremely blessed to be able to have teachers that care so much about this. So I'm really excited to get out there and film.